Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labucan from the Rocks and Stocks News website. Um, I'm a big bull on uh, copper. Uh, I don't think I'm alone these days. It's been uh, performing very well. Um, the big argument is where is all the copper going to come from um, for the battery or the electric vehicle revolution? And uh, the company I have today, Candente, has one of the best undeveloped um, copper projects in the world. It ranks as the top 10 uh, in both uh, size and grade. Um, and uh, I think they're very undervalued. And so I wanted to have uh, um, Joey on, Joanne Fries from Candente. Uh, they just uh, had some important news out. So we're gonna talk about that today. Joey, thank you for joining me again. Thanks very much for inviting me. So not too long ago, you had an important preliminary economic assessment out. And um, again, I want to put that into context. Um, you know, in the last 20 years or so, companies that get taken over for, for developing a project uh, and one that ranks in the top 10 of both grade and, um, and uh, size is the kind that uh, could be put in that category. Uh, oftentimes they're valued at three to five cents per pound of copper in the ground. And Candente is valued at a fraction of a cent. Uh, so I think there's a lot of blue sky ahead for that. Let's touch a little bit on the PEA, uh, Joey, and then we'll get into the uh, news from yesterday. Okay, sure, great. So yeah, recap on the PEA, we've, we've now got a... Um, a project that can get started smaller and then ramp up with through cash flow. So the capex would be about just over a billion dollars, and that's using forty thousand tons per day and um, producing a hundred and I think twenty million tons of uh, pounds of copper. Um, you know what? Make a cut on that. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know that number well enough. Uh, no worries, Joey. Yeah, you can get that. Um, so so um, average average life of mine, it'll be 173 million pounds of copper a year, plus about 31 ounces, a thousand ounces gold and 700 thousand ounces silver. And that's that's for a 28 year mine life. So the first 40,000 tons per, per day uh, is for the first six years and then ramping up to 80,000 tons per day through cash flow. And that PEA was done at what price of copper, Joey? That's 350 copper. 350 right. copper. So we're we're nearing up on that five dollar level, and uh, with the demand that's coming and the tightness of the supply chain, um, I think it's easy to make an argument for five dollars plus copper in the not too distant future that might be around for a while. I totally agree, and so do a lot of people like Goldman Sachs, and I'd rather listen to them than me on those those predictions, but. Yeah, our sensitivities on our NPV um, and IRR is at three, so 350 copper, our base case, eight using an 8% discount, um, our NPV is just over a billion. But if you move that up to 450 copper, so a little under what's current, it's 1.8 and $5, you're 2.24, so, and up to a 24.5% IRR, so very robust project for for this world of copper yeah and that's really what majors are looking for right joey they want size they want grade and they want uh, a good healthy irr um and and long term you know long mine life obviously and um so let's get on to the news you tacked on a bunch more ground around canary echo Yes, we did. Um, Fortescue had acquired some claims um, in the last couple of years since getting involved with us, agreed to transfer them to us. And then we also had acquired three more claims. So um, just rounding out the, the property position, you know, for more exploration, but also whatever else we, we you know, need to do as part of our um, developing the project. And how big, how much larger does that make the project? Well, the actual land package is about twice what it was before, a little more than twice. Um, okay. So yeah. And so why did Fortescue and yourselves increase the ground around Canary Echo? 
Well, I think Fortescue acquired it just after we went into our first, and they did their first investment with us with the idea of helping us protect. And then, you know, if we formed a joint venture, obviously it would go as part of the, just be thrown, you know, included in the joint venture. Since we haven't formed one yet, it, it, it um, was part of the area of interest. So they, they had, you know, agreed to transfer it to us, which was as should be with our relationship. And Fortescue owns a big chunk of your company, right? Yes, they have 19.9, uh, I think right now 19.8% of our company. But over time, it's the 19.9 is, is where they're strategically to be at, yes. So, Joey, I, I think that one of the reasons why at this stage you only have a $59 million valuation, I think it's partially because there may be some concerns about Peru. How do you uh, respond to the, any concerns you might get about Peru? Well, the first thing I guess I would say is look at all the other countries where most of the copper is. <laughs> Number one being Chile, you know, then there's, there's um, you know, DRC and, um, you know, not, not too many places that really have a super stable government. On the, or I shouldn't say stable, but um, long term understood. Um, but the other aspect of that is no matter where you're finding copper these days, one of the challenges is making sure everybody wants a mine in their backyard. Um, so, you know, that happens anywhere you go. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point, Joey. It's not all jurisdictions in, in these countries are uh, the same. And um, I think also a good point to be made is that if you're looking for big copper, there's only certain places you can look for big copper and uh, Peru, Chile are, are a couple of those. So let's talk a little bit about around your, in the jurisdiction you're operating in. Okay. Well, it's a subsistence farming district um, in the lower areas further away from the project, still within the community because the community owns the surface rights. So they are our first stakeholder, of course. And the lower areas, so further from the project, because we're kind of um, in the southern highest part of the community, they have a lot of coffee and fruit and, and really good agriculture, whereas the higher areas, the soils aren't nearly as good. And so it's more, you know, uh, subsistence farming. Um, but, and, and certainly there's people, I guess the first thing would be is that they don't have a chance to communicate all together and understand each other and know everything that's going on. So um, there, there aren't, there are no other mines in the area. There's mines near Mumbai and Cajamarca, but um, so understanding what it means to have a mine in your backyard, you know, it takes a lot of education and experience. And, I, and I, when I say that experience, it's taking them to other places, which the Peruvian government has done, and, and we're certainly helping with workshops as well. And then there's just um, education and access to to information they still don't have internet um, throughout the community. And, um, but there are a lot of people getting educated now. So when I first arrived in the area, we started working there in 2004, the locals would ask us to hire their children and hire, you know, rather than bringing in sociologists and geologists and engineers from other areas of Peru, hire their, their children. And we said, we'd love to, you know, what, what are their skills? What are their educations? And unfortunately, in those days, most of the, the children, you know, were lucky if they were even getting through high school. But now, here we are several years later, there's over 130 um, young people from the community who have university education or are in university. And so our community relations team is actually made up of local um, locals that are educating, you know, getting education in, be it mining engineering, environmental engineering, communications. I mean, every walk of life, um, they're getting educated now. So it's fantastic. So, so it's just changing. And, and you're hitting on some key things that I think it doesn't really matter which country you're in. Um, it's reaching out to those local communities and um, educating them on what, what does a mine really mean? You know, I, I think sometimes it gets lost on people, you know, what kind of footprint you're going to make and how long it could last and the economic benefits. And um, so maybe touch on that a little bit more, Joey. Well, that was a big part of the 
PEA, I mean, to be honest, the first thing we were looking for was a smaller capex, start out smaller, because there's a lot of copper there and it could, it, 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 the, the resource can support a very large operation. But, you know, our, our earlier work suggested, you know, a capex that was 1.56 probably would be 2 billion today and, and certainly worth the kind of operation that it could support. Having said that, for us moving forward, you know, um, on our own or, or with a smaller partner than Fortescue, so to speak, if, if that is in fact, you know, opening up the doors to the number of people that could build this, we wanted to see if we could have a smaller capex. Now, the other thing we really wanted to do is see what's happened in the last 10 years that we could use with technology to improve the environmental aspects. And that's the one thing we're, well, two things we're, we're thrilled about is that the, the tailings will not be wet tailings in a, in a large dam and a separate containment facility from the waste, which both, you know, between all that takes up a lot of space. And as we know from history, uh, wet tailings are dangerous for, you know, contamination. Now the plan is co-mingled waste and tailings and the tailings will be filtered. So you get the water out of them. You use that water in your mine operation. So it's, of course it's a closed system, but now they'll be in the same facility. So you're using up much less space and they have different size fractions. So, so actually they can take up even less space be, by being co-mingled. The other thing we were able to do is get rid of um, what was planned was a roaster because we do have some arsenic. And what we were able to do through geometallurgical modeling is discover that the arsenic's not as high as, as originally thought it could be, or, or yeah, that it was throughout the deposit. It reports to the con much less than, than was thought, like from 85% down to 35%. But also it, it's got a different content in, in about eight different domains, so different rock types, different alterations, which means you can do in-pit blending. And so our con grade is now 0.49% arsenic for the first six years and 0.51 or 0.52 life of mine, which is very, um, very marketable. So not only did you, um, you know, look at ways to de-risk the project, um, you've brought the, the economics of it look a lot better from this preliminary economic assessment than the historical one. Yes, certainly if you want a smaller capex, absolutely. I mean, I'll be honest, the best economics, the best IRR you're going to get on a project is start big and, and stay big. But these are, this is another option that, that we really like. But, you know, to put that into context, one billion sounds big for a, for a junior, but for majors, mines are one to two billion dollars these days anyways. And you know, finding good copper projects that can have a 20 plus year mine life uh, is not that easy. So um, I think you've, you've opened up potential buyers uh, or potential co-developers um, quite dramatically by bringing down the CapEx or, um, you know, opening up both possibilities and, uh, and opened up the door to a lot more uh, interested parties. You're absolutely right. Somebody like Fortescue, Rio, Rio Tinto, BHP, <coughs> excuse me, um, they're all they're all going to probably want to start much bigger. Although I I would I would let them know that for permitting, I think it'll go a lot faster if you start smaller. But um, yeah, the options are are out there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, I think we've done a good job of sort of outlining everything, Joey. Oh, I think I've uh, Joey's having a bit of technical difficulties there. Uh, nonetheless, I was going to wrap things up anyways. So I'm going to say that I, I started out by saying how undervalued I think that uh, Candente is. Um, and uh, so oh, we got you back, Joey. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, sometimes it's those internet gremlins. Yes. Um, I was going to wrap things up anyways, Joey. Was there any closing comments you wanted to make? Well, just that we announced a financing with Lind, and um, they had invested with us with Fortescue last summer in, in a straight equity placement. Now we're going to do a convertible equity. And what that means is they don't they don't start converting for, for till the, four, the normal four-month hold is off, four months and one day. 
and then they convert, but they convert over the two year period. So as we're doing fees, we'll have the money for feasibility. So as we're de-risking and um, you know, Im improving the value of the project, they'll be converting little by little each month. So it's a great way to be, have a nice long-term shareholder that is, is not, not creating so much dilution right now. Perfect, Joey. I'm going to close things off again. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us because uh, uh, it's great to find a good copper story out there because there's not a lot of them. Thank you. Okay, Joey, I'm going to close things off. Hang around and we'll chat at the end. So uh, there you go, folks. Um, uh, I started out by saying that uh, Candente has a top 10 asset in both grade and, um, and size in an undeveloped uh, copper project. I think copper projects are going to be under strong demand, the undeveloped ones in the future. Um, I, I think that this is gonna be a future mine. Uh, I don't know if Candente will be the one that develops it. Maybe they are sold, uh, bought out or possibly a, a partnership kind of arrangement. Uh, either way, I think you can. Uh, I think I've made the case that a fifty-nine million dollar valuation with an asset like that uh, is trading at a very steep discount. I'm a, I'm a bargain hunter at heart, and I love copper. So uh, I think that those that share those kind of um, ways of looking at investments, you want to buy cheap. This is where you want to be looking at buying. Uh, and uh, I think they've got plenty of catalysts to unlock value. So on that note, as always, my shows are for information purposes only. It's important for you to do your homework and speak with your financial advisors. I do recommend you to do that homework, check out their website, look at that preliminary economic assessment and a few of their last news releases because I think there's a lot going in favor of Candente these days, and I, uh, I like it a lot, as well as copper. So have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.